I'm a rambler, I'm a gambler, I'm a long way from home, and if you don't like me, then leave me alone. I'll eat when I'm hungry, I'll drink when I'm dry, and if moonshine don't kill me, I'll live till I die. Hello, my name's Luke, and welcome to Scapegoat, the podcast where we decide who gets the blame, and who gets away with murder, sometimes literally. We're recording this episode on the 4th of July, American Independence Day, and many different things are associated with American Independence Day. Fireworks, the colour red, white, and blue, parades, balloons, and a buttload of booze. But it might surprise our listeners to learn that uh, within the last lifetime, alcohol was banned in the United States. So if you imagine opening a cold one on the 4th of July, there's some people alive today who could remember when that was completely illegal. This was illegal during a period that we call Prohibition. Prohibition happened between 1920 and 1933. All alcohol sales were completely banned. So today we're going to look at the reason why alcohol was banned. Was it being scapegoated by people who just hated alcohol, or was there a legitimate reason for this ban? Who wanted this ban, and why did it get cancelled after 13 years? So that's the topic we're going to look at today. But before we start in on that topic, where we'll discuss its context and who did it, we're just going to talk about the word prohibition itself. Prohibition simply means something is prohibited or banned. So while many people today associate prohibition with alcohol in the United States, there's been other prohibitions in other countries for many, many different things. For an example of this would be in New Zealand, there's been a prohibition against bringing in strange plants or animals for many, many years. If I tried to bring a hamster into New Zealand, they would be terrified and be like, no, do not bring the hamster into New Zealand. Actually, that sounds far more South African, but they would say, don't bring that hamster in because it could destroy our ecosystem and everything will go badly. Equally, in the Republic of Ireland, for many years, alcohol was banned on Good Friday. So there's a prohibition on alcohol just during Good Friday for religious reasons. So you couldn't buy, sell, or you weren't supposed to drink alcohol on that day. That was just the law. So it was prohibited. We're going to start by talking about American prohibition by describing it and talking about it in context. Prohibition was a nationwide constitutional ban on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol between 1920 and 1933. It's important to note there that that law said nothing against people drinking alcohol, just about selling it or making it or transporting it. If you still had alcohol, you could still drink it, but many people didn't and they weren't allowed to, so they couldn't drink alcohol during this period. We have to discuss this in context. Where did this ban come from? Because many people just simply think this came from a complete bubble that just suddenly appeared as a complete fluke in the 1920s and then just disappeared. But there's a long history of people wanting to ban alcohol in the United States. There's different movements which would be described as the temperance movements. Temperance just meaning people who don't want other people to drink alcohol. And these people from the early 19th century were just trying to ban alcohol. They were successful on a small kind of regional level in town cities and maybe even states throughout the 18th century, but their bans weren't that effective. So I'll give you a couple of examples of what happens. An early example of what happened in the early 19th century in Massachusetts where a town banned alcohol. They banned the sale of alcohol, but people always found a way of getting around this particular problem. The bartender, since he couldn't sell alcohol, said, here, come around and have a look at my pig. So the bartender in the small Massachusetts town would take people to a barn around the back of his bar and they'd see this pig and they'd pay him a dollar to look at the pig. And when they paid him the dollar, he would give them a free drink complimentary on the house. He wasn't selling it, he was giving it to them. And this skirted the law because they were paying to see the pig and they were getting alcohol for free. This is just an example of people just widely not caring about the law. The same happened in Maine where there was a statewide ban in 1851 where people largely just ignored the law. And when the government tried to enforce it a couple of years later, there was a mass riot in the capital city of Maine, Portland. Eventually, the government just had to retract the ban on alcohol because things were getting too violent. Many other states tried to ban alcohol throughout the century. For instance, Delaware, Ohio, Illinois, Rhode Island, Minnesota, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New York. However, all of these but one retracted these bills because they were just unpopular and they were seen as temporary because the government would pass a bill and then the next government would come in and say, no, we'll get rid of this bill. The first state to really start taking it very seriously was Kansas, 
who banned alcohol in their constitution, so it was a lot harder to change. But even when they banned alcohol in 1881, it, what this ban wasn't strongly enforced. So they banned the sale of alcohol, but bars and saloons were still open throughout Kansas. So many people got upset by this and started to take temperance into their own hands. There was an example of one lady called Carrie Nation who went into bars throughout Kansas and pleaded of customers not to drink. When they kept on drinking, she came back in and she started saying, no, you have to stop drinking or God will condemn you. They ignored her. Third time she came in, she came with a hatchet and started smashing up the place, destroying bottles of alcohol throughout the establishment. And this quickly caught on. So there was different groups called the Carry Nation Prohibition Group, who would basically go into saloons throughout the South and smash the place up. So many ended up in jail, but again, they were trying to stop an illegal activity, so their fines weren't major. And this entire idea of prohibition caught on throughout the South, and by 1913, six southern states had become dry, meaning that they didn't drink alcohol, or alcohol was banned. And throughout the 1910s, more and more states began to ban alcohol. By the start of the First World War in 1917, or the, smart, the Americans entered the war in 1917. Anyone from the UK will say, no, it started in 1914, or anyone from uh, the Balkans will probably say it started in 1910 or 1912. Well, when America entered the war, 12 states wanted to ban alcohol, and they wanted to ban it for different reasons. So we'll go into the reasons why they wanted to ban it. Many people believe alcohol caused a lot of crime and disorder. So this came from the saloon culture. So saloons started popping up throughout the American suburbs in the 1880s. Originally, bars had been outside of the town. As America became more industrialized, there were saloons on street corners, and they were very public. And in these saloons, a lot of very seedy behavior happened. There was poisoned alcohol. The alcohol was bad content, so people would be getting sick everywhere. There was prostitution was rampant in these places. Gambling was rampant in these places. Politicians would be openly going in to take bribes. This was happening in the center of towns and cities throughout the country, so many people started to associate alcohol with the seedier parts of society and started saying, no, no, if we get rid of alcohol, we'll get rid of all this evil corruption and all these bums and we'll get rid of them and throw them out of town. And there was also the constant problem with people associating alcohol with poverty. Many people associated people who went to these saloons as going and spending all their family's money over a couple of hours so their family wouldn't have shoes or clothes or even food because their dad went out and pretty much drank it away. A very common problems were also to do with health. Before, people were getting poisoned by alcohol and they were drinking a ridiculous amount and by a ridiculous amount, I mean, by today's standards, they were drinking a ridiculous amount. They were drinking about three or four times the amount the average person would drink now. And the amount was really climbing. So in 1900, the amount of beer Americans drank was just over one billion gallons. By 1913, that was two billion gallons. Also, the amount of spirits went up by 50%. It went up by a half as well. People were getting sick and they were missing work and they were dying of cirrhosis of the liver. There was a serious health problem being coming from this alcohol as well. And World War I also helped change attitudes about alcohol. Many people were originally not against alcohol, but World War I changed their minds. Because as the American forces landed in France, many people started to complain that the American forces didn't have enough food. And they said, a lot of the food, or a lot of the grains that we could be giving towards bread for our soldiers, are being used towards alcohol. Why are we wasting these when our boys in the field are dying without food? So a lot of people were complaining about the lack of food that American soldiers were getting, and a lot of people associated people who drank with absenteeism. They said the clean-cut people who don't drink, they're the people who go to the front and fight for us. And the people who drink are the people who stay at home cowardly. So alcohol started to get a really bad reputation. Also, the people who made alcohol in the United States were largely from German descent. Germany had a large brewing culture and German Americans brought it over. So even today, a lot of the brewing companies that you think of in America, like Schlitz or Miller or Budweiser from Anheuser Busch, they're all from German descent. So people start saying, look, we're fighting the Germans. Why are we giving all these German Americans our money? They're unpatriotic. They're probably going to give the money to the Kaiser himself. 
So there was a lot of anti-German feeling. People were like, oh, drinking is unpatriotic, and if you're drinking, you know, you're really funding the enemy. This was another element of why the anti-drinking culture became so popular. Also, it's important to understand, at the time, politics were very volatile in the United States, and there had been a rise, for instance, of socialism, with a lot of socialist mayors, 70 socialist mayors throughout the United States in that period, and people trying to get rid of the potential risks of socialism, and other people trying to get women's rights, because women's suffrage was happening at this time. Many people connected with temperance were also connected with women's suffrage, but we'll get into that in a minute. Generally, everything was up in the air, and people were slowly just starting to turn on booze. They said, no, this is bad. So we're going to look at the groups who wanted to ban alcohol. Well, the first big one we're going to look at is the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which started early in the 19th century. And this group just really was based around women of evangelical Protestant backgrounds. And these people strongly believed in the Protestant work ethic, and they believed it was being badly affected by alcohol. And they thought, you know, America is a Protestant country, and it is important that all these great Protestant men do not drink. We make the strongest country in the world. And alcohol is seen as a very Eastern European Catholic evil influence, and we need to stop this. Generally, this group was very exclusionary. They didn't allow in, for instance, black people or Catholics or immigrants. This was seen as a very kind of like elitist movement to try and stop these people from drinking. Again, it was tied very strongly with women's suffrage. So an early suffragette, Frances Willard, was strongly involved in the women's temperance movement. She did this for different reasons because she, is so, she did believe in temperance, but she wanted temperance to happen because it was a woman-led movement, and she felt that this could give women a stronger say in politics. So if they were allowed to speak on temperance, they could further other progressive issues, such as prison reform or labor laws, and would help women get the vote. Later feminists, such as Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they were also involved with temperance, because it was seen as just, a even if they didn't believe it, it was seen as a great way to get women into politics, so this was a hot button issue for this group, and it slowly grew. It was only about 22,000 people in 1881, but just before temperance was passed, it was about 300,000 people. This women's group was highly influential and was growing and was a major pressure group at the time. Now, the second big group which helped get this passed was the Anti-Saloon League. The Anti-Saloon League, again, was a quite a right-wing organization. They focused on the anti-German hysteria and put out a lot of propaganda saying Germans are glutton, anti-Americans, and put them into a faceless group that were set on the destruction of Western society by beer. These guys start being quite racist against Germans and the Irish and saying, these people are lower people, we won't let them into our organization, and we need to save them by stopping them from drinking alcohol. They were supported by many groups, many famous rich people from the day, like industrialists like Henry Ford, John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie. They all put a lot of money into this group. And the reason they put money into this group was they wanted their workers to be more productive, and a lot of them were teetotaled themselves. They felt this would help the American economy to do this. There's a bit of a rumor about John D. Rockefeller that he wanted to fund this because he had money in petroleum and he thought that alcohol would be the next fuel for cars and lamps and all this sort of stuff with ethanol. He funded Prohibition to try and stop this, but this isn't really true. Prohibition was only against drinking alcohol, not industrial alcohol, so that's, that, it, that rumor isn't really true. The Anti-Saloon League was also supported by a third group, the Ku Klux Klan, who strongly enforced prohibitions. The Ku Klux Klan were a strong enforcer. The Ku Klux Klan had died in the mid-19th century, but there was a second revival of the Klan happening throughout the early 20th century. A lot of this was linked with temperance. For instance, in Atlanta, where the Klan no longer existed, the idea of prohibition helped reorganize the Klans. The Klan around prohibition reorganized in Atlanta in 1915, and one of the Klan's most leading issues was support for prohibition. They adopted it as their central rallying cry. It was part of their new reform agenda. 
And the Klan was also built up by the movie Birth of a Nation. They were starting to get very positive propaganda. The numbers in the Klan were growing. Suddenly had 3 million members. And these 3 million members were trying to enforce prohibition extremely strongly. Just after the First World War had ended, a bill was put through Congress to try and ban alcohol and add this as a constitutional amendment. It quickly passed through both houses of Congress. And a lot of people say the wheels of justice were oiled by money from Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller. The bill, after it passed through the, both houses of Congress, the president attempted to veto it, but they overrode his veto. Slowly, one by one, the states began to agree to prohibition until the 36th state, Nebraska, agreed. And it was therefore a constitutional amendment. It meant that prohibition was going to go into law the next year on January 17th. The famous evangelist at the time, Billy Sunday, said, The slums will soon only be a memory. We'll turn the prisons into factories and our jails will be in storehouses and corn cribs. So, did this fail? It absolutely failed. The day prohibition happened, on 12.01am, on January 17th, when prohibition had been passed by one minute, a gang of six masked bandits emptied two freight cars full of whiskey. Other people also went into a rail yard and stole casks of grain alcohol, and another truck of whiskey was also hijacked. Because alcohol was now a banned substance, a black market immediately grew, started by the mob, to let people drink if they wanted to drink. So the mob was profiteering off illegal alcohol. Soon, a lot of buildings called speakeasies began to pop up. So these were illegal bars, which would be frequently raided. These bars, you could just go in and buy alcohol. And they were in almost every single district. So there was a lot of these throughout the country that they were illegal and they would be raided. But there were so many, it was hard to stop them. And the mob also started to legitimately try and find ways to sell alcohol through loopholes. So one of the loopholes that they found was if you had a pharmacy, you could prescribe alcohol for medical reasons. So the mob started to buy a bunch of pharmacies and if John Smith turned up and he had a bad back, what would they give him? Alcohol. If someone else turned up and they had a headache, the doctor would prescribe them alcohol. So alcohol began to get be going through for medical reasons through pharmacies and it was very easy to get that way. Another thing that the mob did to try and sell alcohol was they would bribe priests and rabbis who had wine for religious reasons to give it out to their parishioners. Religious wine, which wasn't covered by prohibition, a lot of people suddenly began to become a lot more religious and the mob had a hand in giving these people the alcohol that they wanted. Now, many people also believed that when prohibition came into effect, that people would just suddenly say, oh no, we actually don't want alcohol. As you can see, via speakeasies and this alcohol culture, people just easily found their way to getting alcohol. The money the government imagined people would stop spending on alcohol and start spending on other things never really materialized. There was the belief that a bunch of things would start to increase in money, that alcohol money would go towards them. So soda fountains, chewing gum, the theatres, restaurants, people thought, now these will flourish, now that people will not spend their money on alcohol. But instead of not spending their money on alcohol, they just didn't spend their money, or they spent it on black market alcohols. The government, the amount of taxes the government fell by a massive amount. New York State, 75% of their tax money had come from alcohol before prohibition, and there was a huge deficit. In the United States, there was a $10 billion problem that the money were from taxed alcohol disappeared. And $10 billion is a lot of money now, but it was a huge amount of money in the early 20s. The government was missing a lot of tax money, and this was just going off to the mafia, who was selling the alcohol in bathtub gin for, and people like Al Capone were the ones making the money, not the government. A lot of problems started to occur. Equally, the KKK, who had been a major supporter of Prohibition, ran into a scandal in 1925 when their chief dragon, or the head of the KKK, had been put up for a murder charge. The numbers of the KKK members who had been enforcing Prohibition 
which was about 6 million in 1925, plummeted down to the tens of thousands. Millions down to thousands. Prohibition was largely being discredited by the KKK. And a lot of the groups who had previously endorsed this were slowly starting to fall apart because people like the Anti-Saloon League had been a one-issue parties. The second it was passed, their group slowly started to fall apart. You could probably see an analysis with similar things with Brexit now. That Now that Brexit has passed, the groups who wanted Brexit no longer have anything to do and they're slowly starting to fall apart. But it would be wrong to say that this was entirely popular just to stop it the second it happened. For instance, in 1928, the presidential election was run between a wet Republican, as in a person who wanted to sell alcohol, and a dry Democrat, and the Democrat won because the Republican <laughs> was trying to bring back alcohol, and people still liked the experiment. They called it a noble experiment to try and ban this. Other things that happened in culture was it actually led to the start of NASCAR because a lot of bootleggers drove cars very quickly. They souped them up to try and avoid the police. And this was actually the origin of NASCAR that once Prohibition ended, a lot of the people who were previously bootleg drivers became NASCAR drivers. And that's where the sport originally comes from. Prohibition also had a bad effect on Americans because it permanently corrupted law enforcement because the mob were giving money to law enforcement to turn a blind eye and not try and raid their establishments and they bribed the law the courts and politicians so since then the mafia has had a larger effect on u.s politics and a lot of this comes from prohibition and it also affected u.s drinking culture after prohibition because it largely encouraged people to drink at home. So previously there had been a giant saloon culture and people had drunk outside and they knew their neighbours and it had been a giant societal thing. Thanks to prohibition, people who were drinking alcohol tended to know that it was illegal and they'd bring alcohol back home. And that's permanently affected American drinking culture with a lot more people drinking in, at home than in bars. And I can tell, tell you from my own experience of living in different countries, drinking at home rather than drinking in bars is a bad way to go about it. In Ireland, we used, when I was growing up, we used to do things, something called pre-drinking, which is you couldn't afford to go to the bars, so you drink a bunch of alcohol before you went out, and that is really a bad way to go. If you look at other societies, like, for instance, German or Czech, where they just go out and just drink beer in a bar, it's far more pleasant. So that is another negative effect of prohibition. Prohibition really began to fall apart when the Great Depression happened. Because the Great Depression happened in the stock markets. Different people think that Prohibition had an effect on the Great Depression. It certainly didn't help that America was missing so much tax money and it was going to the black market and they didn't get revenue. In 1929, FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, pretty much ran his presidential campaign in 1932 on I will reverse prohibition and we'll get this money and we will be able to drink booze and do whatever we want. He got elected by a landslide. Other states at the time were beginning to go back against prohibition and several states were trying to legalize beer and wine at the time saying prohibition was too harsh. So the entire thing fell apart by 1933 and alcohol was completely legalized but they had the problems that many of the bars and the establishments which existed before Prohibition had closed, many of the breweries had closed, and Mafia was now a bigger part of society than it had ever been. But is it wrong to say Prohibition was a complete failure? Well, according to an MIT and Boston University study, they saw that initially alcohol consumption dropped by 70%, and many people saw it as a noble experiment. But by the mid-1920s, people thought, ah, oh, screw your experiment. And the numbers had returned to the levels that they had been pre-prohibition. People were not spending their money legally. They were spending it on illegal booze. There was a common joke going around at the time that people could find alcohol easier under prohibition than they previously could. And that's actually probably true. Alcohol was easier to get your hands on. When the mayor of Berlin, Gustav Boes, visited New York City in the fall of 1929, one of those questions he had for the New York mayor was, when would prohibition come into effect? The problem was, 
prohibition had already been law for 10 years. Just people disregarded it to the extent that the German mayor just believed that you could legally get a drink. But prohibition had some positive effects. For instance, deaths caused by cirrhosis of the liver fell by 60%. So 60% of the deaths related to alcohol fell during Prohibition, initially at least. That was seen as a positive thing. However, on the other hand, a lot of alcohol-related injuries, such as blindness and paralysis, increased because a lot of the bootleg alcohol was poor quality and it negatively affected people. So a lot of alcohol-related injuries went up because the quality of the alcohol went down. And the effect that it has today is free American states, Kansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee are still technically dry states, even though prohibition is finished, that they're dry states by default. Counties can specifically authorize the sale of alcohol, but by default, it's illegal within the state. That is what happened with prohibition. That is the story of it. In my personal opinion, I think prohibition was a very negative thing because a religious, a vocal religious minority managed to overturn a right that all other people had. So these groups, these uh, um, these people like the Anti-Saloon League or the Women's Temperance Movement, they managed to, although the majority of people who voted always voted pro-alcohol, they managed to get it overturned for moral reasons. And I'm always very negative about other people's morals affecting things that other people can do. So I think prohibition was, as people say, a noble experiment, but I don't really think it's that noble. I don't like the idea of people taking things away from other people and throwing them away. If you want to be temperance, if you want to be temperate, fine. Don't drink yourself. But it affecting other people, I think it's bad. I mean, I think it's good they managed to get people to drink less. I think that's always a positive thing. But really... Banning something all completely, I think, is very negative. I want you guys to tell me what you think. Do you think, according to the Evans here, that alcohol was scapegoated? Or do you think it was a good idea to ban all alcohol? I've given you my opinion, but you can give me your opinion by contacting me on Twitter at scapegoatpod. You can also contact me at scapegoatpodcast at gmail.com. I'd also like to dedicate this episode to my dear friend Gordon in Korea. Now, Gordon would be celebrating the 4th of July today, and he is an absolute party hound. The man drinks crazy, and I'm glad that he is going to be able to celebrate this holiday with his family, namely his brother Budweiser, his cousin Coors Light, and his uncle Miller Genuine Draft. So enjoy those beers, Gordon. And finally, I would like to thank Not Another Fake News Podcast for sharing my podcast. It's a great podcast if you have the chance to check it out. It's generally talking all about different fake news stories. And it's a monthly podcast, really good quality. Look it up, Not Another Fake News Podcast. I'd also like to thank Disaster Artists again for sharing me. Uh, I mentioned that in the last podcast, but yeah, they shared my material and that's great. So thanks very much, guys. And I'll see you on the flip side. Bye-bye. I announce this meeting soon. Can you kick in with my share? And all oh, brother, if you want more riches, save a little dram for me. Laura, hallelujah, drinking gin ain't against my teaching. Treat me with equality. Mm-hmm.